Hello, and welcome to New Scientist Weekly, your curated selection of the week's science stories. I'm Timothy Revel in New York. And I'm Christy Taylor, also in New York. This week on the podcast, a geological society has surprisingly rejected a proposal to name our current era the Anthropocene. The U.S. military is asking ChatGPT to help them win simulated battles and new evidence for bumblebees having culture or something like it. Plus, don't forget, big news to come from the world of blue cheese. Yum. But first, back in 2021, a company called Colossal launched with the aim of bringing extinct animals like the woolly mammoth back from the dead, with the not insignificant side goal of helping to combat climate change too. The company doesn't want to just make one mammoth, though. It wants many of them to be grazing in the Arctic, helping prevent the expansion of forests that absorb more of the sun's heat and accelerate the thawing of the permafrost. It's really quite the ambition. And this week, the company says it has made a major breakthrough in its quest. It's cracked the tricky problem of making elephant stem cells. Michael LePage joins us from London. Hi, Michael. Hi. Hi. All right. Colossal says this is a big breakthrough and you've been talking to people inside and outside the company about it. What do you make of it? It doesn't quite sound like we're in mammoth making territory just yet. Well, Colossal has said its first baby mammoth will be born by 2028 and it's sticking to that claim. And I think it's just about possible it could create an elephant that's a bit mammoth like by that time. (laughs) <laughs> but the, the the odd thing is, I don't think the breakthrough that it announced this week is actually going to help it meet that deadline. That said, these stem cells could in the long term help with the company's aim of producing those thousands of mammoth-like elephants that you were talking about. Okay, I feel like there's a lot to unpack here. What yep. do you mean when you say mammoth-like <laughs> elephants, not mammoths? What, what are we talking about? Okay, so resurrecting mammoths exactly as it were is never going to happen because we're never going to get a perfect genome from a frozen mammoth. In fact, we still haven't got a single perfect human genome yet. However, it's completely feasible to edit the genomes of living elephants to make them a bit more mammoth-like, and that's what Colossal is doing. So it does acknowledge that what it plans to create will already be a cold-resistant elephant, but it claims that it will have all the key traits of the woolly mammoth. So it could look like a mammoth, smell like a mammoth, trumpet like a mammoth, but it won't be exactly the same as the mammoths of times gone. So I guess then there's this question of whether these animals could actually help preserve the Arctic permafrost? Yeah, and I think that's still an open question. Even if it's true that mammoths can help preserve the permafrost, to make a difference, they're probably going to need to be tens of thousands of them. And then you're going to need to introduce these numbers in the fairly near future before the permafrost thaws. Okay, so how do you produce tens of thousands of mammoths in a hurry? So Colossal's answer is to produce artificial wombs. Now that, of course, would be a huge achievement by itself. I don't think it's impossible, but it's going to be really difficult and really expensive. And so that brings us to now. They say they've made some sort of breakthrough. What is it? Okay, so what they've done is they've taken adult cells from an Asian elephant and it's turned them into stem cells. Now, other teams have tried to do this and failed. So this is, this is a genuine step forward. But Colossal's aim, basically, it wants to start by editing elephant cells to make them a bit more mammoth-like, then use this technique it's developed to turn those edited cells into stem cells, and then next, it wants to turn those stem cells into eggs and sperm. Now, that's been done in a few animals like mice, but it's still really tricky, and I think it could take a, quite a few years before... Colossal manages to generate sort of elephant eggs or sperm this way. That makes a 2028 target for mammoth-like elephants seem quite a long way off. Yeah, and and to achieve that target means that they need to be implanting these gene-edited embryos in surrogate elephants by the end of 2026. That's not far away. And the reason it's so soon is that elephant pregnancies last two years. So how are they going to do that if they can't use these stem cells to do it, they're probably going to have to create the embryos using cloning techniques. Now, the thing about cloning is it might work, but the success rate is really low. That means you're going to need to get lots of elephant eggs and create lots of cloned embryos and stick them into lots of surrogate elephant mothers to have a sort of good chance of getting a healthy mammoth-like elephant being born. And that obviously is really problematic, both from an animal welfare point of view, because you're going to have to extract all these eggs and sort of put them back in elephants. And it's also problematic from a conservation point of view, because the numbers of elephants are declining. Asian elephants are an endangered species. Yeah, that does sound pretty problematic. 
And de-extinction in general seems fraught with so many ethical issues. Is there an argument that Colossal shouldn't be trying to create mammoth-like beings at all? Yeah, there are so many issues here. So, I mean, personally, I'm generally in favor of rewilding, of trying to restore animals that can carry out the same ecological role as extinct animals. But I wrote a piece a while ago about how many conservationists are failing to take climate change into account. They just assume that places that are suitable for certain species now are going to stay suitable when they're not. So I think the big issue with bringing back mammoths is that they're going to be Ice Age mammals in a rapidly thawing world. Even if people live in the Arctic are happy to have mammoth-like animals roaming around on their land, it's not clear that that land is going to remain suitable for these large numbers of mammoths. So the world's going to be two degrees Celsius warmer before 2050 even, and the Arctic is warming even faster than that. So if we want to preserve Arctic ecosystems and the permafrost, the only sure way of doing it is to slash carbon emissions. And right now, carbon emissions are still actually going up. If you follow the news, particularly on the environment, you've probably heard of the term Anthropocene. It's usually used to informally describe the rough period in which human activity has been so significant and widespread that it has impacted the Earth on a systematic level. Think large-scale deforestations or, of course, greenhouse emissions. Well, over the past few years, a team of scientists have been working to formally put the Anthropocene on the geological timescale. But on Tuesday, as revealed by a report from the New York Times, the proposal to define this new human-dominated epoch was soundly rejected. Reporter Chen Lai has the details. Hey, Chen. Hello. All right. So let's go back to the Anthropocene itself. What is the big deal about defining it formally? And also, what else should we know about how it's currently used? Yeah, so you summarize it pretty well already. For context, just under 12,000 years ago, the Holocene, our current epoch, began. It marks a time of more stable climate where humans really prospered and thrived. But over the past few decades, human activity has ramped up so much that some geologists argue that we've entered this new epoch, the Anthropocene. Anthropo as a prefix just means human-like or humanoid, like in the word anthropomorphize. Lots of evidence used by the The geologists date the start of this new epoch to around the early 1950s, with fallout from nuclear weapons explosions being the main geological marker. All right, so on one hand, we have some concrete markers that could be defined and pinpointed in time. But how does the process of defining a new epoch from such markers actually work? So back in July, the team of scientists working on the Anthropocene, called the Anthropocene Working Group, put together a proposal for it. This included the site that they thought has the best evidence for the epoch, which was a small lake in Canada called Crawford Lake. It has well-preserved radioactive isotopes right in the lake bed, which corresponds to nuclear weapons testing around the early 1950s. The proposal was formally put to the AWG's parent body, the Subcommission on Quaternary Stratigraphy, in October. And as far as I understand it, that subcommission had a few months to talk about and vote on the proposal. But we didn't hear the results from them. There was a leak. Yep, that's right. So according to the New York Times article, the majority of the SQS voting members voted against the proposal, with 12 votes against, four in favour and two abstainers. Did that come as a shock? I mean, that's a lot of people voting no. And my impression was actually maybe we're expecting the vote to go the other way. Yeah, it was definitely a shock among some. So a statement from the AWG that we got the day of the article The members expressed disappointment over the proposal, stating that they still believe there's ample evidence for the Anthropocene as a geological epoch. If the AWG is so in favour of this definition, why did their parent body vote against it? What actually happened? Yeah, so it's a very complex topic and a very complex process. I spoke to some people on the voting committee and the general thinking was that the substantial human impacts on Earth stretch much further back in time than the 1950s, with the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s or even the colonisation of the Americas earlier than that. It's also thought that it's much too soon to define such a new and so far brief epoch. Some people alive today would be older than the Anthropocene, in fact, And that's a vanishingly small time period in geologic terms. All right. I want to go back to this whole process, though, because there are kinds of news that get leaked all the time. But it feels very strange to learn about a scientific decision via a leak. That's weird, right? 
Yeah, very unconventional. In fact, it seems that the AWG weren't even notified of the official voting outcome before the media got to it. Does that complicate what may happen next? Yep, and the saga doesn't end there. So a press release released on Wednesday from the SQS, the day after the leak, said that the outcome of the vote was unverified and the voting took place in violation of processes set by its parent body, the International Commission on Stratigraphy. The leak has apparently put the reputation of all these groups at risk and the chair of the SQS has actually sought to begin a motion to annul the alleged vote, as they say in their statement. That's a lot of different acronyms and layers of group membership, but the short of it is that the international geology community seems to be scrambling a bit at the moment. Yeah, all quite surprising. Not (laughs) normally what we expect from a scientific vote like this. That leaves the question then, what does a rejection of the Anthropocene really mean here? So if the vote had been a yes, then it would have been forwarded for more voting rounds. If the proposal passed to those, then it would be an official epoch on the geological timescale. Practically, it means that textbooks would change, geologists would use the definition in their papers and so on. But even though it seems that geologists have declined to define it this way, it is by no means a rejection of the negative impacts humans continue to have on the planet, including climate change and biodiversity loss. The term Anthropocene is still an incredibly useful and important term used across the natural sciences, social sciences, and even the humanities. Many geologists who are against this particular proposal still want to define the Anthropocene as an ongoing event which doesn't need formal ratification and doesn't even need an official start date. If you're looking for a little extra heat in your life, why not take a listen to our latest escape pod? It's all about warmth, from the super hot vibrations of bees to the emotional warmth that some researchers are trying to instill in robots. That's in your feed, all ready to listen to. And if you've ever looked up at the moon on a clear night, you're part of a lineage of humid curiosity and observation that goes back thousands of years. For next week's Culture Lab, I talked to author Rebecca Boyle about her new book, Our Moon an exploration of our very special satellite and how it shaped our lives. That's coming Tuesday. The following message is sponsored by the UK Department for Business and Trade and the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, the MHRA. In the second in our sponsored series exploring how the UK has transformed its ecosystem for clinical trials, we meet Professor Andrea Manfred from the MHRA. We ask how his team is delivering one of the biggest overhauls of UK clinical trial regulations in 20 years. Available free at newscientist.com slash podcast. Militaries around the world have long been exploring ways to use artificial intelligence, everything from using AI to quickly analyse images to even helping to select targets. But with the latest explosion of capabilities in large language models, militaries are looking at ways to expand how they use the technology. And now, according to a story from technology reporter Jeremy Sue, US Army researchers are exploring whether technology like OpenAI's chatbots can help them to make better decisions during conflict. Jeremy Sue joins us in the studio in New York. Hi, Jeremy. Hey there. Talk us through this latest research. The US military is not actually taking orders from AI yet. It's just in a computer simulation. That's right. Uh, We know that the military has been experimenting with possible uses for AI chatbots, but no real military actions were performed in this particular research. Instead, the US Army research team used a handful of commercial chatbots, including uh, OpenAI's GPT-4 and older models from other companies to help make decisions in a video game. It's a science fiction interplanetary game called StarCraft II, and they used a modified scenario with a small number of total units. Mm. The AI agents were given information about the simulated terrain and friendly and enemy forces, and their training data also included military lessons on attacking and defending. Then a person playing the role of the commander in the simulation assigned objective points for the AI to seize and also directed the AI agents to destroy the opposing forces. So that's the setup. How did the AIs actually do? Well, after each prompt, the AI assistants responded typically in just a few seconds by presenting multiple possible courses of action so that the human commander could then ask the AI to refine their proposals, such as maybe making sure that certain friendly units took control of a specific bridge. And then the human commander could approve final orders. 
the assistants that run on OpenAI's GPT models did the best in terms of how quickly and thoroughly they accomplished their objectives, but they also suffered the most casualties compared to the other AI agents. I mean, the most casualties, that doesn't exactly feel good. Is this kind of use case anywhere close to being real, though? Well, right now, the U.S. Department of Defense has an AI task force that is flagging nearly 200 possible military use cases for generative AI. And if the military were to use GPT-4 outside of these simulations, OpenAI technically does allow for some military applications relating specifically to cybersecurity. But the company also explicitly prohibits using their technology to, say, develop weapons or to injure people or to destroy property. Mm. So the scenario this research tested would still be off limits. And experts I spoke with are pretty dubious that having a chatbot perform well in a simplified war game simulation would actually translate to being useful in complex real world conflicts. Yeah, there are certainly questions about if the technology is good enough. But then, as you hint at, there are also questions about if it's actually what we want, what the companies want, but also what we might want. It feels like the ethics of military AI is still really to be properly worked out. There's especially questions like who is ultimately responsible for AI-made or AI-suggested decisions. That's right. There's absolutely both a technology and ethics challenge, you would say, at least when you talk to national security experts, they'll say it's generally just not ready. But there's also a human complication that engineers have long been aware of, known as automation bias, which means that basically human users of technology may be more inclined to trust advice from an AI system, even if the humans have access to information or evidence that the advice is wrong. So the concern here is that if the AI were to offer bad advice, even the most knowledgeable human operators may still be inclined to take it. And you can imagine that could easily be disastrous in any kind of high stakes scenario. Time for the life form of the week. Here's a hint. It's a small animal that can pull off a big trick. I'm talking about bumblebees who it turns out can actually help each other solve puzzles that they wouldn't be able to figure out alone. And depending on who you ask, this may indicate that these bees have culture. Freelancer Sophia Qualia is here right now. Welcome back, Sophia. Hi. All right, so Sophia, pardon the pun, but what is the buzz? <laughs> okay, this, this might sound like a tiny discovery, but it's actually causing quite a stir in the scientific community and a lot of debate. Last year, I followed an experiment where researchers trained some bumblebees on how to open a puzzle box to access a sugary snack. The experiment was very simple, though. The bees had to push a red lever one way or a blue lever the other way. The trained insects then had to show their trick to a bunch of bumblebees that had never seen the puzzle box before so they could open it too. And it turns out that even if the naive bees figured out other ways to access the sugar independently through trial and error, they still preferred the method their bumblebee sisters had shared, as if it were a social trend, a cultural trend. Yeah, I remember that story from last year, but I also remember there being quite a few critiques. Some people thought that this was kind of a very basic, minimal form of culture. And, you know, pushing a lever isn't the same as learning an intricate song or a dance or the works of William Shakespeare, for example. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this time the researchers challenged the bees to an even harder puzzle box. The sugary snack could only be accessed after maneuvering the same levers, but in a very specific sequence. And when the researchers let three different colonies of bees attempt the puzzle box on their own, none of them could really hack it through trial and error. They couldn't figure it out. The bees played with the puzzle for 12 to 14 days, and that's a lot in bee time because they'd usually go looking for food for just about eight days in their whole life. Mm -hmm. So when the researchers then trained nine of the bumblebees on how to open the box, though it's important to add here that the training was actually really, really hard and the researchers were having a lot of trouble and they had to give the <laughs> bees a lot of extra sugar rewards along the way to like get them to do the puzzle – but once the knowledgeable bees were reunited with a bunch of naive bees that had no clue how the box worked, they swiftly showed them how to crack the code without any issues. That's really amazing. I mean, so a crack team of bees knew how to get to the honey, and then they taught a bunch of other bees how to do it when they returned. Bee movie would have had a very different feel if it had been a heist movie instead. 
Yeah, the world definitely needs more bee heist movies. <laughs> <laughs> so what what's the actual verdict here? Does this count as a more sophisticated, elaborate kind of social learning or culture? Or is there still some doubt about that? Well, if the bees are learning from each other how to do something that they wouldn't have been able to learn on their own, it technically counts as a form of cumulative culture. Cumulative culture is something scientists had long thought is unique to humans. Yeah, so that's what allows us to pull off stuff like modern medicine, right? No one doctor can discover all of medicine from the start of history, but they use centuries worth of knowledge every day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And since this is such a big deal, the jury is still really out on this one. Some experts I've spoken to think this research reasonably casts doubt on human exceptionalism. And the study came out together with a very similar research paper on chimps. So it's a growing body of research that kind of is starting to suggest this. But skeptics still don't think these findings are enough to support the conclusions. Mainly, they don't think the puzzle box was that impossible to figure out, for example. I think the bigger picture here is that if social culture really does play such an important role in animal lives, it's like a second form of inheritance, right? It's like in the face of biodiversity crisis, animals don't have to only rely on their genes to adapt to changes. They can rely on culture to change their ways much more quickly too, and maybe get a better chance of survival. Guess what, Christy? There are some new cheese molds in town. That is exactly the news I needed today. <laughs> which molds? Which cheeses? I hope it's blue cheese, maybe stuffed in some olives. It is blue cheese. And as I'm sure you know, blue cheese gets its funky flavor from fungus, specifically yes. Penicillium roqueforti. And that's a relative of the strains that give us the antibiotic penicillin. And it basically eats some of the cheese it's in, producing those tasty compounds and distinctive blue veins. The thing is, researchers have been concerned about how genetically uniform the cheese-making strains of this mold are becoming. Is this kind of like the concern, you know, farmers might have over having only one genetic variety of corn, that kind of thing? Yeah, exactly. Because these molds produce asexually, there's even less opportunity to bring new genes into the gene pool, and harmful mutations can potentially accumulate over time. And much like farmers might worry about corn, as you say, it's possible a lack of genetic diversity in cheese mould would leave the cheese-making process more vulnerable to parasites, viruses, or other disruptions. And so researchers, they took the four main strains of P. roqueforti, and only two of which are actually normally used for cheese, and then they did some crossbreeding. And what they got were five new mould strains – and these mold strains have different properties from the original cheese making strains. So that could lead to cheeses with different amounts of blue marbling or perhaps more excitingly, different flavors. And as a fun bonus to all of this, these new molds may have useful drug properties too, since they can produce compounds already known to be useful for suppressing the immune system or fighting tumors. Yay, fungus. Truly the wonderkins of the tree of life. All right, I have a bit more of a sobering story for you, Tim. We know microplastics are essentially everywhere in our world at this point, and they are also increasingly in our bodies. And while there's a lot we still don't know about what all this means, health reporter Grace Wade looked at new research that finds microplastics are connected with worse heart health outcomes. How did they actually figure that out? I feel like there is so much, as you say, we don't know about what microplastics mean in our body yet. So this, this is very interesting. Yeah, what they did is they looked at the plaques that build up in the walls of your arteries, which can increase your risk of heart disease already. But this new research looked at what happens when your artery plaques also happen to contain microplastics. They monitored a group of 250 people who had had surgery to clear plaques from one specific artery. The idea was that if there's one plaquey spot in your body, they probably had others. And the research team could then chemically analyze the plaques that had been removed. For one thing, it turned out that more than half of the participants had microplastics in their artery plaques. And in the four years that followed their surgeries, the people with microplastics were four times more likely to have a heart attack or stroke, which suggests that those microplastics are contributing to heart disease. Why would they be doing that? Do we know why or how microplastics could actually lead to that effect? That's unfortunately not clear. As you said, we still don't know so much. But they did detect higher levels of inflammatory compounds in the plaques that also contained microplastics. So one idea is maybe these microplastics are driving more inflammation, which, as we know, is a risk factor for these heart events. 
All right. Well, I've saved perhaps the weirdest little story for last. We're going on an astronomical field trip to a white dwarf. And these form when stars run out of fuel and then cool and freeze. But some are mysteriously youthful looking compared to how old we know them to be. They're basically hotter than they should be given all the time they've spent cooling. It's like they've frozen in time for billions of years. I'd love to freeze in time for billions of years. What's the secret? (laughs) Well, that's the question. Researchers have been running simulations of the insides of these white dwarfs, and one possibility they've hit on is the formation of carbon and oxygen ice crystals being responsible. Hmm. If you get ice crystals made of carbon and oxygen like that, forming in the center of a white dwarf, one thing that could happen is that they may end up floating upward to the surface because they're lighter than the elements like neon that surround them in a white dwarf. When this happens, the ice pushes other molecules out of the way, which generates heat and keeps the white dwarf from cooling. And that cycle can continue for quite a long time because the ice melts when it reaches the surface, leaving this kind of chemical churn to continue until all of those lighter elements are used up. Once that happens, the white dwarf resumes cooling at the rate predicted and begins to age again. I have to say this sounds like the kind of thing that could maybe affect our understanding of astronomy, if this is what's happening. It absolutely could. White dwarfs are used to help find the ages of other cosmic objects because their cooling rates were previously thought to be reliable measures of time. So they're really useful astronomical objects. But What this suggests is we may not actually be able to accurately know how old white dwarfs are just by looking at their temperature. And that could throw off a whole slew of other age estimates too. And one quick thing before we go. If you like moons, well, the JWST telescope is officially on the hunt to look for evidence that they exist outside our solar system. So-called exomoons would be satellites orbiting exoplanets, and they could be another chance to find evidence of life. Observing missions approved late last month would focus on looking for small moons orbiting a Jupiter-sized planet and so-called moon-sized moons orbiting Earth-sized planets. And with that, that's all for this week. Thank you for listening. You can find all the stories we talked about today in the show notes and you can subscribe to this podcast on whichever app you're listening on. Plus, if you like the great stories we're bringing you, please give us a rating or review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Share your favorite stories or just tell your nerdy friends. We'll be back next week. Bye for now. Bye. This podcast is produced by OG Podcasts. Find out more at ogpodcasts.co.uk. 